Hallelujah. John 1 and 43. Verse 43, let's stand just for a moment. We'll give honor to the Word. We won't keep you up, but just a second. We're just going to read a few verses. I'm reading out of the New King James Version. Verse 43 says, The following day Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethesda, Bethesda, at the city of Andrew and Peter. Now Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote. Now, I want you to understand before I go much further, this is early in the beginning of Jesus' ministry. This is before they've seen all the eyes open and all these things. This is the beginning. And, and, and who they're calling Nathaniel here, I believe, is uh, Bartholomew. He'll be called later in the New Testament. But they said, we, he said, we have found him who Moses and the law and the prophets has wrote about. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for your word, Lord Jesus. I thank you, God, for this opportunity to gather, God, Lord, in your name. And I ask your blessings on this message today, Lord. I, I can't do anything of myself, Lord. And I, I stand always empty, Lord, of what I have, God. And I need you desperately, Lord, to fill my mouth, Lord God. Speak through me today, Lord, that we could be blessed by you, Lord. Because without you, Lord Jesus, Lord, I have nothing. And I praise you, God. And we give you all honor and glory, Lord. We ask this, Lord, that we be strengthened. Lord, that your people be strengthened today, God. Lord, that we walk out of here encouraged. Father, we walk out of here, Lord, lifted up today, God. And we're so careful to give you all praise, honor, and glory in your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Said the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. Um, now, we read here talking about Jesus and where he's from. And, um, and, and, and I want to minister to you on this thought today. It's how he knows. It's how he knows. Um, we think so many times of Jesus and, 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 and we think about, and, and I'm going to slow down just a little bit today if I can. I want you to really get this. We think about Jesus as like, the Bible says that he was tempted in every point as we were tempted. He went through, he knows what we go through. Why? Because he was born of a, of a woman. He, when he was a little boy, he skint his knee and it hurt and he cried to mama. He, he bled just like every one of the rest of us. But yet in his veins was not the blood of a man, but the Bible says that the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary and she conceived. So he was not born of sin. He was not born of sex. He was immaculate conception. So the blood inside of his veins is from Almighty God. But that little boy that was born of Mary... The Son of God, you'll notice that He always claimed to be the Son of Man because He was born of a woman. And being the Son of Man meant that He knew everything that man goes through. He felt every pain that man goes through. He felt every stress, every anxiety, every oppression, every depression, every, everything that we feel He had. Just because He was the Son of God, the Lord uh, uh, of heaven, did not mean that there was a, a special kind of something for Him that He didn't feel everything. We think about God walking around here and doing miracles. We think about what big deal is it for God to go through this and God to do that. But I want you to understand something. There is a man named Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God. Now after Calvary, we know when we go to heaven, when you go up there, all you're ever going to see is Jesus. Because He is the housing place of the Almighty God. When that sinless vessel died, a sacrifice. Almighty God, the same one that David, when David said, I want to build you a house, a temple unto you, God. And God said, you're a man of blood, David. You can't, but we'll let your son build a temple. But He said, David, I'm going to build you a house through His bloodline. Jesus, come through the lineage of David. He said, I'm going to build a house that cannot be made with hands. That is the man, Jesus Christ, the housing place of the Almighty God, the sacrifice, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the earth. 
And in Colossians, the third chapter, it said, All the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Him bodily. After Jesus died on the cross, He became all in all. He was all God Almighty. But before Calvary, you can't kill God. Who's going to kill God? I've heard preachers misquote so many times that God died for your sins. You cannot kill God. Oh, but the Son of God. We have John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. I hear people misquote it so often times and it gives us such a misconception that He can't know what we go through. That he, he can't possibly feel what I feel. He can't possibly understand the stress and the anxiety and the loss and all the things. How can He possibly? He's God. and What big deal is it for God to endure a few things? We have to get an understanding. I want, to, I want you to know today, it's how He knows. Jesus was born to be the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. But He wasn't born in a palace. Uh, we all know where was Jesus born? In a stable. With some animals. Some critters. Had to leave Nazareth because they were trying to kill Him. But see, Mary and Joseph was from Nazareth. You may not know this, but if you look in the Old Testament Scriptures, you will look over and over and over, and if you try to find Nazareth in the Old Testament, you can't find it. Because it's never mentioned. Galilee, which is where Nazareth is part of, it's kind of like you'd say Nashville and Old Hickory is kind of the outskirts of Galilee is the main hub of the main town there that, that Jesus is the man of Galilee, but he's actually from Nazareth. I've been doing a little study, a little research on Nazareth, and it said at that time it was probably somewhere between three and 500 people in Nazareth. Nazareth was not a popular place. And if you even notice in Scripture, every time they describe Jesus, they also, when they say uh, the, the, from the, um, or, or from, when they describe Jesus in the, uh, of where he's from, they have to say Jesus of Nazareth, or when they say Nazareth of Galilee, they have to, they have to put a tag on there of where he's from because nobody knew where, he, where Nazareth was. Nazareth was not popular. Uh, it, wasn't, it was not ever mentioned through history. Such a small little place. But I, as I did research, I found out that in Nazareth, there's some things that we look in the Word that you'll see a little differently than ever before. It said they were often thought of as being ignorant because of the way they had such a heavy accent. It said some of the words, and it went through to use them, and I, I, I didn't because they were, you know, another language, but it, how close in the, the writing, but meanings could be so... It's almost if you would like, uh, like Cajun people talk. They had that thick accent, which another Cajun understands just fine, but everyone else around them... Did not. Said so a lot of the people from Nazareth, they had that thick accent people couldn't understand. And they would say things that would seem like it made no sense because people thought they were using other words. And they were often accused of just being podunk, ignorant people from this little town of Nazareth. Not a major city, not a major place of, of income. So when you find places where Jesus would speak and they would be like, is this not Jesus of Nazareth? And they would make mention of how he spoke. It's because the Lord's voice and people begin to understand someone that they normally could not have understood. Hallelujah. I want to get you to an understanding of where he started from. I want you to understand that Jesus, as he began to have a foundation in his life, his foundation started off uh, in a manger. He was uh, born being uh, threatened to die. He, he went all the way back into Nazareth, into this little town of three to 500 people where people knew him, knew he was Joseph's son, thought he was a, a, a carpenter's boy, knew everything about him. And the Bible even goes back as far as to talk about when he uh, come into his own, he come back to those and now how they rejected him. Is not this, uh, is not this uh, Jesus... Uh, the, the son of Joseph. Let's, let's go a little further in Scripture. It said, Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Nazareth had a reputation of the people that were Nazarenes of being another part of what they, they said. They were hot-tempered. That They would uh, uh, fly off at the... Uh, 
just being angry. Type. So they had a reputation. And it's kind of like, imagine this. Basically, Jesus was like born in a, what do they call that area out there? Um, what do they call it? Uh, Dodge City. You know what they call Dodge City in Nashville? He was basically born in one of the roughest, or he was raised in the roughest, worst reputation areas that you could imagine. I'm just trying to make an example. So when people didn't think of him as being a priest... They didn't think of him as being a man of God. They didn't think of him as being the Messiah. They didn't, he, he, he started from the negative of negative of negatives. The poorest of the poor. Probably people knew that, that Joseph wasn't his real daddy. They probably even made a, uh, may have falsely accused Mary of, of messing around or something before she was married because Joseph really wasn't his daddy. I'm talking about how he knows things, how he heard words as a child, and how he heard accusations and things spoke over him. I'm talking about understanding as a little boy, he went through things. I want you to understand he knew what it was like to be poor. He knew what it was like to be probably hungry at times. He knew what it was like to have to probably work for his next meal as his father is trying to supply for the, for the children. He knew what it was like, I'm sure, to be broken in need and understand, God, I need something. So when, he, when you see the Scriptures and He encourages people to love the poor, to be kind to the brokenhearted, well, how do you, where do you think that come from? When he, encouraged and he, when he said it's so hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven, where do you think it come from? It come from His raising. It come from those feelings on the inside of insecurities. It come from that little boy that was scared at times and hurt at times. Because he felt everything that you feel. I want you to know something. There's things that we go through and we feel sometimes like God does not understand. We go through things in life and we're like, we think nobody knows what I'm feeling right now. Nobody knows the pain on the inside. Nobody knows the thoughts in my mind. But can I tell you, Jesus knows. Everything. He started in the worst of the worst. He started in the lowest of the lowest. And even as his ministry going, even the very ones that were going to be following him, his very disciples said, can any good thing come from Nazareth? This is somebody that's fixing to follow him and be a disciple. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But see, things begin to change. After Calvary, and I'm going to try not to get ahead of myself too much. Things change after Calvary. People begin to recognize things differently. People begin to uh, address Nazareth differently. Why? Because Jesus walked around healing the sick. He walked around doing miracles. He became famous. He was uh, at times maybe infamous. And his infamacy changed to fame. What do you mean? I mean, at times where he would come in... People come through his shadow and be healed. People come down the streets. If I could just touch the hem of his garden uh, garment and touch his, his robe and him stop and say, I felt virtue leap from my body. And the woman come around with the issue of blood. She said, it was me that touched you. I just was, I, she was in fear. Because she received healing, didn't know what to do. Why? Because they'd never seen it like this. So when this man said that we have found the very one that Moses said was coming, the Messiah... The one that the prophet said was coming. The Messiah. How many people said, Jesus of Nazareth? Can I tell you that there's people sitting in this room right now that God has ministry. God has things for you to do. There's places that you will go. There's people that you will talk to and someone will say your name and they will say, Shay Miracle? The guy that was in prison, the guy that was in DC4, the guy that, that was on drugs and had these problems, him? No different than people have said, Joe Wood, the guy that used to live next door to the church, he, he, he's going to pastor? Do all the horrible things. There's a reputation that sometimes that, that follows those that are chosen, follows those. And your infamacy in the spiritual realm will turn into fame. Hallelujah. Because you'll be able to do things and reach people in same places no one else can reach through the anointing of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 
Among the Jews, Nazareth's reputation was poor enough, but outside Israel, the town wasn't even known. Which is the, I read this from this is the article I was reading, which, um, which is why each of the gospel writers had to explain what Nazareth was. It says, a town in Galilee. Every time they would mention Nazareth, it would say a town in Galilee because nobody even knew where Nazareth was. Hallelujah. He says when they were first mentioned. Whenever we find, the, the, uh, find His name on the lips of foes throughout the Scripture, they always say Jesus of Nazareth in a derogatory verse. Every time you, you didn't hear the disciples, they were calling Him Master. They were calling Him Rabbi. You heard Him when people would come to Him, they would, they would call Him Rabbi and Master. But when you find those that were foes against him, those that was coming against him, they would call him Jesus of Nazareth because Nazareth had a negative uh, connotation to it. it. It was like tagging on a, a slur to him. When they put Jesus on the cross, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, Pilate put on his inscription, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, because it had a negative connotation to it. Because Nazareth had a reputation. But I want you to understand something. The reputation of Nazareth has changed. The reputation of Nazareth has changed. The reputation of Joe Wood from Old Hickory, Tennessee has changed. People no longer think of me as the man with the connect. They don't think of me the way they used to. They look at me different. People call me pastor now. I'm actually respected in my community. It took a little while. But you know what? The negative connotation to my name no longer bears the same fruit. The negative connotation to my name has changed. And I want to tell you something today. God has got changes for us. I don't care how far you've been. I don't care how deep the valley has been. I don't care how how much trouble, how much, how bad our path, all the things from our yesterday. I want you to know something. He knows. Because his name has been tainted before he was famous. He had a reputation that followed him before he was Jesus the Messiah. Hallelujah. Whenever we find his name on the lips of foes who want to give it a derogatory spin, expect them to call him Jesus of Nazareth. And if Nathaniel's comment on, uh, and the venom of demons and detractors had not been enough, Pilate inscribed it in the instrument on, uh, on his torture. Same thing, Jesus of Nazareth. I want you to understand something today. We have got to come to the point to where we stop letting our thoughts rule us. Because the enemy will speak into your mind the most negative things. And if we don't allow the Lord to change things, we will believe them. I look and I can't help but think, what if... Jesus was to listen to all those voices. What if the King of Kings, born to be the Deliverer and the Savior of the world, you know why the enemy, we all know why the enemy come against Him. He did not want Jesus to deliver all of us with His own blood. He come against Him on every hand. When the demons would see Him, the demons would say, Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to torment us before our time? And He would command them to be quiet. There is a change coming in the name that's above your name. The negative connotations that the enemy wants to put upon you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus in Luke 4 and 16. It said, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. Now we here we find Jesus coming home. He's been doing miracles. He's famous on the outskirts of his hometown. You would think that the hometown people would be like, Ah, Jesus is coming home. Let's have a parade. Finally, somebody got out from here. Why do we do the same thing? Why do we do the same thing? Instead of lifting up somebody that makes a change in their life, we want to try to poke them apart. Oh, we'll see if it's real. Somebody get clean. Uh, They go to rehab. They they make some changes. They come out from the neighborhood they were from. They educate themselves. Whatever the situation, people will say, oh, we'll see. 
Instead of lifting them up in success, they want to hold them down. They want to pull them down. They didn't lift up Jesus' name when he come back in town. They knew the miracles he had been doing. They knew the great things. But see, that negative, kind of that negative spirit, they were living in it. They had been listening to it. They thought there was no change for anybody in Nazareth. They didn't think anybody, there was any hope. Can I tell you, you get change in your life. There's some people you're not going to change by your own testimony. There's some people that's never going to change. There's some people that's looking to drag you down. They're waiting for you, Sister Nikki, to fall. They're hoping you're going to fall. There's some people because they feel so down and so alone, they're, they can't wait for you to fall. So they can say, oh, see, I knew it wasn't real. I knew it wasn't real. There was people waiting to see if Jesus would fall. There was people standing in Pilate's hall. that No one could actually accuse him. But they were following him everywhere, looking, the Bible said, to accuse him. Because they desperately wanted to see him slip. Constantly coming at him with scenarios and situations, trying to see if he would slip. Brought a woman caught in the very act of adultery. People standing around with stones ready to kill her. And they say that all of Moses said that she should be stoned to death for being caught in this act of adultery. But what say you? Jesus drawing on the ground. As they continued to hound him for an answer. He finally answered. He says, those of you that has no sin, let him cast the first stone. What more powerful words because we have all sinned. We are all guilty. But yeah, we'll see somebody doing better and we'll throw rocks at them because we don't realize that our own sins condemn us ourselves. We condemn ourselves instead of lifting somebody up. Instead of giving praise to somebody doing good, we want to knock them down. We have people come from the, from the ghettos and places and people instead of lifting them up when they come out of these things, they want to say, oh, hey, I've heard it. I've heard it. Neighborhood I grew up in, a, a, a man that I know Come from the neighborhood. Drugs all around our neighborhood. All around him. I watched him work, put himself through college. His single mom couldn't do it. I watched him walk from Hopewell to all the way down in Hermitage uh, off of Lebanon Road where the Sonic used to be for years. Walking back and forth. He become manager saving dollar after dollar after dollar until he got enough money that he could start paying for college. And he worked for a while and his mama got sick. And you know what he did? He put college on hold and he took care of his good mama. And then when she got better, he went back to walking back and forth. He put himself through college and right now he is a wealthy man with a college degree. You would think that the whole neighborhood would be putting a parade up when Torn comes through the neighborhood. But you know what? They don't. Because all the drug dealers are still dealing drugs. And they'll say... Oh, what are you doing around here? You think you're too good? Huh? You, you ain't come around alone. You think you're too good? That. Can I tell you that is not the ones that's going to help you? Can I tell you it's time to avoid? Jesus, he told them. He's in the middle of the synagogue here in Nazareth. They're in church. Hallelujah. It says, so when he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, And as the custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all that were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, in your eyes, right before you. So all who bore witness to him, to him and bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? The gracious words, why? Because he didn't used to be able to talk this way. He didn't used to talk so eloquent. Do you know God will change your speech? He'll change the habits of the words that come out of your mouth. The things that you didn't think you could stop saying, you'll stop saying. 
He, he'll, start, he'll change the, the way you talk, the way you act, if you'll change. See, when Jesus left Nazareth, there's a lot of Lazarus that stayed in Nazareth. Sometimes we've got to leave our past in the past. You've got to leave Nazareth in Nazareth. What does that mean? That means the way you talk in Nazareth, leave it behind. Uh, the people you hang out in Nazareth, leave them behind. Uh, all the things of your, uh, all the things that negative stuff, you got to leave the negative behind, and you got to go out, and you got to find the ministry in which you were called. You got to leave the negative behind, and they were marvelled at his speech. That's what, what God. And they were marvelled, and I never, I never knew until I was doing this study that his speech made him sound something different. Have you ever heard someone and listened to them in just a few minutes? You go, my God, they just sound like an idiot. I'm serious. <laughs> I've seen people that they're, especially through drugs, people just like, my God, they're just ignorant. The things they do, that's just ignorant. It don't make sense. You've got to leave Nazareth behind. You've got to let God change your tomorrows. Let Him change your speech. Let Him change your future. Let Him change it. Change the name that's been put above you. And instead of having a negative connotation, let the Lord put a brand new future in front of you. Let the Lord change you and everyone look at you and they don't think of who you used to be. All they think of, uh, of you now is the God that is within you. The God that was portrayed before you and the speech that comes out of your mouth is no longer what it used to be. Hallelujah. But it's of the will of God. They said, is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, you will surely say this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we, heard, whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here uh, in your country. You know what he was telling them? They were like, if you, said, if you this healer, we heard about what was going on outside of Nazareth, but if you this big healer, you go on and heal, you go on and do this. But this is what Jesus said. Then he said, assuredly I say, to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, and the heaven was shut up three, three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except Zephyrath in the region of Sidon. What does that mean? It means there was all kinds of people that was in the land of God's chosen people. But nobody had enough respect unto the man of God, unto, the, unto the, the mission of God, to trust and have enough faith. But an outsider, somebody from another place, the Lord chose to help because they were not from that area. It goes right on down, it says that there was a man named Naaman that had uh, uh, leprosy. It said, there was, was there not lepers in Israel that needed cleansing? But none of the lepers received cleansing because they didn't, wasn't looking for the faith. They wasn't looking for the man of God. But a man from another land, a Syrian, heard the words and the tales of a young uh, woman that was in, enslaved and in prison, that there was healing in Israel, and he come believing, looking for a miracle. So what are you saying? I'm telling you that people will come to the church and the house of God, service after service after service after service after service, put their money in the plate time after time. People will claim to be a Christian year after year after year. They claim to love God year after year, but they're not looking for the miracles of God. They're not looking for the real will of God. They're not looking for the changes of God. They're not looking to change their life. They just want to have a title put over them as a Christian. They just want to feel like when they die, they're going to go to heaven, but they've not studied enough word to want change, to want to really, really please him. He said there weren't many miracles done here because they weren't looking for miracles. It took somebody on the outside desperately looking. Do you know that's why the Lord works so mightily in prison ministry? That's why the Lord works so mightily when we have tragedy and we have things going on in our life? That's why because all of a sudden our world is in a turmoil and in a tornado and we suddenly start looking for help and the Lord all the time has been there waiting, trying to pour out a blessing on us, waiting to give us a new name, waiting to give us a new future, wanting so desperately to show off just how good He can be to us. But we have been not paying attention because we've been here all the time. But when all of a sudden everything is spinning and we're in need, then, then we, we look and the Lord says, oh, you need, here, let me give it to you. And He is so gracious. Say, how does He know what I need when I need it? Because He's been there. Because He felt everything. 
He was in his hometown. They didn't bring a parade. They brought rejection. Hallelujah. Can I show you a couple things? And I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to... I'm trying to preach and teach at the same time, and I just... It's hard to do that. Hallelujah. I want to I break something down just a little bit in those, the Scriptures that Jesus was reading. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is prophecy that had come from, uh, from the prophets all the way back from the Old Testament, way before Jesus was born onto this earth. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And this is the very words were spoken was prophecy about Jesus. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. How is it, from the, it, was, it was prophesied that He's going to have a, a fondness for the poor. Because it was foreordained that he would preach to the poor. Why? He was born in the poor. He was raised with the poor. He seen what it was like to have need. There's a difference in people that have need and those that need nothing. Total different. Perception is different. Everything is different. You have, you have us here in, in, in our middle class. We feel so poor. But when I look at the children over in the Philippines, I realize I'm not so poor. Hallelujah. Talking about real need. He says, anoint me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Do you know what brokenheartedness is? That means when your heart hurts. There's things sometimes when you hurt inside, you can't put a band-aid on it. It's one thing to put a, a, a cast on a broken arm. It's another thing to uh, put a, a band-aid over a cut. But you, how do you help a broken heart? Only Jesus. He's, and, and you notice it's one of the first things he says. I come to help the poor, and I come to heal the brokenhearted. Do you know why? Because when we're brokenhearted, everything else is broken. We don't function right when we're brokenhearted. Nothing else seems to line up. When we're, we can't even think straight when we're brokenhearted. He said, I come to help the poor, and I come... Well, I mean, if you're starving to death, it's hard to receive anything else either. I come to make sure you've got food in your belly, and when you've got food in your belly, I want to make sure that if your heart is broken, that I help you. To preach deliverance to the captives... Deliverance. I look the word up. It says, um, oh, I guess I didn't write it down. Sorry. I won't give you the deliverance. Oh, hang on, hang on. Maybe it's right here. I think I put it on the end here. Deliverance is release from bondage. And I took this straight from the Greek translation. Deliverance says release from bondage or imprisonment, forgiveness or pardon of sins. Letting them go as if they had never been committed Remission of the penalty. Hallelujah. To preach deliverance to the captives. To preach freedom. To preach as if it had never happened. Uh, pardon as if there was no penalty for what you've done. That's freedom. That's the deliverance we're talking about today. Independence Day. That's that freedom I'm talking about. And recovering of the sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised. Now I want you to I want to point something out here and, and, and I'm almost done. If you look up where it says to the liberty, to set at liberty, it's the exact same definition as deliverance. The exact same definition. But it has two different things. One said deliverance of being captive. But this said to be delivered of being bruised. The word bruised from the Greek translation is to be crushed. To be oppressed. To break into pieces. To shatter. To smite. To, to go through. See, there's a whole other thing when you're held captive. See, sometimes we're held captive by our own thoughts, by our own actions. But there's a whole other aspect of being set free from being crushed, oppressed, anxiety, stress. To be broken in pieces. Have your heart broken. He said, I come to give you liberty from being broken, from being oppressed. I come to give you a release of your imprisonment. Sometimes our brokenness imprisons us and we can't seem to get away. He says, I come to open the door. I come to release you. Hallelujah. I come to let you go as if it had never happened. I come to set you free. Jesus, how do you know what I'm going through, what I'm dealing with? He already knows because he's been there. From being born in a stable, from being raised in the ghetto of Nazareth, 
from every negative connotation attached to his name, even to the cross attaching it. But I want you to know something. The apostles took his name, and when they changed after Calvary, when they said, how did you heal this man? They said it was nothing miracle in us, but in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, this man was healed. And from that point forward, in the name of Jesus of Na- Nazareth, was no longer had a negative connotation. His name, that name of Nazareth was now recognized under healing, under miracles, under deliverance. Everything you need, God has got to change for you. And I don't care how bad the enemy wants to break you down. God has got good things for you. Let's stand. Hallelujah. 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 Today is the day of change. Today is the day of freedom. And all you've got to do is say, Lord, I need you. Can I tell you, he's waiting on you. You can be like the religious world that feel like that, uh, you know, I went to church today and I, I got everything I need because I showed up and the Lord knows that I, I love, He knows my heart. He knows down in, I know I'm not made no changes, but He knows my heart. Or you can say today, Lord, today is my day of change. Today, Lord, I lay it all down. You can tell Him today, Lord, I give you my brokenness. Lord, today I give it all to you. I lay it down, Lord, I need you. I trust you, Lord, today. Lord, I need you. Can I tell you that the Lord will not leave you alone? He loves you. He loved you when you come in this door. You ain't been alone. He loved you before you woke up this morning. He loved you when you were born. He loved you in the womb. There's been an enemy that's been trying to destroy us all since birth. You're made in the image of God and the devil hates you because of it. And he wants to see us all rot in hell. Because that's where he's going But the Lord said, I don't want any of my children to suffer. I don't want my children to go through these things. If you suffer, let it be suffering for the fact that you wanted to go through it enduring for the cross sake, not because the enemy has put something on you that don't belong there. Can I ask you today to talk to Him? To reach out to Him if there's sin in your life? Ask God to forgive you of every sin. If there's anything in your life that would hinder your relationship with God, would you give it to Him today? Would you leave it on an altar today? The altars are open if you want to pray. Uh, If there's something that you want to give to God, leave it to Him. Lord, I'm leaving it here. I'm not picking it back up. Anything that would stop you from reaching the throne of grace, Lord, I give it to you, God. Every problem, every circumstance, every everything, Lord, every vice, Lord, every device the enemy has against me, Lord, I give it to you. Hallelujah.